what happens to these people when these gentlemen with pointy swords turn up? The Romans are a perennial topic of fascination. In part, like so many aspects of our own society, draw back from Roman heritage. But also because they are so annoying. The Romans led huge amounts of formation, written, sculptural art, and And we need to be careful not to be blinded by themselves that left us and to think more widely about aspects of impractical thinking. The soldiers were not coming into Scotland and doing this before, they were coming in to conquer and slave. And that's a critical perspective to remember as we think of the country. We also need to remember we need to be cautious of the information we always leave behind. This is a map, medieval copy of a Roman map in Britain. Do you spot the obvious problem? Now there are two plausible explanations. The more boring explanation is that in the compound surveying era of the bottom of this map at the top, things began to go wrong and get further along. The interpretation of the pair is more fun. The Romans didn't believe it was possible to live north of 64 degrees north, <laughs> which on certain days you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, but Scotland didn't even get going. They felt they had to bend the ground in order to fit it into their maps. So don't always believe what the Roman source is. It's an important point to remember. And nobody is going to watch the Gantt monuments they left behind. Don't have geometric historical sources for Romans. We have to rely on the archaeological. But some of the history and some of the sculpture gives us this very dominant propaganda view of the conquest and bloodshed. Here from the extent of the Antonine Wall, a proud Roman cavalry riding down these locals depicted as naked barbarians. <coughs> these people had no voice, they had no right to be. And let me give you one example of how archaeology can do this. Not a local example. We head to Galloway for this one. This is a find from an Iron Age site. It's a mould. It's a mould for making fake Roman coins. And it immediately gives you a rather different view on the potential complexities of these relationships. So the Roman attempt to conquer the land we now call Scotland is really a story, a play in three parts. In the late first century, under the governor Agricola, in the middle of the second century, under the emperor Antoninus Pius, and then a punitive expedition under the emperor Septimius Severus and his sons in the early third century. We'll touch particularly on the first two of these, but even before the Roman legions reached the land we now call Scotland, there were attempts at, if you like, softening up or reconnaissance missions. So we have this scatter of red dots represents Roman finds turning up in Scotland before the Romans got here. And it's a thin scatter that suggests attempts to get to know the country. The nearest one locally is on the top left here, this gemstone of Alexander the Great found near Arthur's seat which dates to the late 1st century BC, but perhaps the most tantalising East Lothian find is this gold coin and so-called aureus of the Emperor Augustus, the first emperor, died in AD 14, so long before the Romans got anywhere near here. But there are two problems with this find. One is that it was an old find recorded only as coming from somewhere near East Linton, now, Traprain Law is tantalisingly close to East Linton, but we can't be confident it's any connection. But more worrying is the, is the cut mark across the face of the emperor, which suggests somebody testing the gold quality. And it suggests this coin may well have been in circulation for a long time, and somebody nicks it to check if it's genuine or not. So this, sadly, is not good evidence of attempts to explore East Lothian through, through gifts of gold. It's one of these things that may have come to the area hundreds of years later. But there are indications of a changing world. The, the hill forts that Ian mentioned 
the defences of those are not really being actively built at this period. By the Roman Iron Age, by the time the Romans come into this country, hill forts are largely ancient monuments. And people are living in the wretched hilly enclosures or in the settlements over the top of the hill forts. And there are indications of changing societies. Societies increasingly with haves and have-nots. Here from the excavations under the Empire Cinema, Dunbar, came an Iron Age burial. Two bodies within it, one of whom was kitted out with weaponry. Bottom left, a long sword and a spear. And it's an indication, perhaps, of troubled times. Perhaps already the, 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 the bow wave of the Roman world is leading people to consider taking up arms. Those arms were as nothing compared to the might the Roman world brought. People are playing by two different sets of rules here. An Iron Age world where the occasional person, the high-ranking leader, may carry a sword versus a Roman army where every single soldier has sword and body armour and helmet and shield and all kinds of unfair advantages like slings and catapults. So as the armies come into Scotland in the late 70s AD, they move quickly through the south, and we'll come back to the East Lothian impact in a minute, digging um, a camp at the end of each day's march, the traces of which we can still see from the air today and heading north, up most likely into Aberdeenshire, where at a hill called Mons Graupius, the massed ranks of the Caledonians are brought to battle. And in a sad foretaste of Scottish sporting disasters, despite overwhelming odds, they managed to lose, it seems. This place may have been Benahee, one of the great hills of Aberdeenshire, it could have been pretty much any hill north of the Forth. The crosses marked on this map have all been claimed as locations of Mons Graupius. What we can say with some confidence is it didn't take place in East Lothian. So what was happening in East Lothian at this time? Well, it's striking. I realise at the back you'll struggle to see this, but the red dots and the lines are marking the positions of Roman occupations, certain or possible, in this first century occupation. And East Lothian is a striking gap. And there are reasons to believe this gap, because much of our evidence for this doesn't come from upstanding sites, but from aerial photography, as Ian mentioned, sites that show in the barley and the wheat crops, and the wealth, the arable wealth of East Lothian, mean it has a tremendously good aerial photographic record. And the fact that we don't see pictures like this, this is from Kirkubrishire, or Roman fort popping up in the barley. The absence of these sites in East Lothian is probably likely to be genuine. There is no strong military presence in the area, and I'll come back to the implications of that later on. The occupation is fleeting. One of the Roman historians says Britain was conquered and then, for Caledonia was conquered and then promptly abandoned. The Romans pulled back to the Tyne Solway line, built Hadrian's Wall. Didn't quite look like this, but something like that. But the key part of our story from the Roman point of view comes with the next emperor. On Hadrian's death, he is succeeded by Antoninus Pius, a man who orders the legions north again. And opinion is divided on this. Antoninus Pius was no military man. Some scholars argue he needed a quick military victory. Southern Scotland had been conquered already, so he sent the legions back in. But there is increasing evidence of trouble in the north. The building of Hadrian's Wall may well itself have caused chaos. And there is evidence of conflict and violence in southwest Scotland, in um, the area around uh, Eccolfechan, Burnswark, and Dumfrieshire, those, you'll see the concentration of red dots of Roman forts and fortlets in that area, which suggests this was a genuine trouble spot. Since I'm from Galloway, I've always considered people from Dumfrieshire are a bit problematical, so this for me just makes perfect sense. Key for us, though, is how he defines the edge of the province. A wall is built from sea to sea, from the Forth to the Clyde. And while the Roman occupation goes further north than this, the roads and the forts run to the Tay, the wall is clearly intended as a barrier. And we can believe it's intended as a barrier because of the extensions to west and to east, down the Clyde and along the Forth. 
And this is where East Lothian comes into the story. For Inveresk is a critical part of this, these coastal defences, running east from the end of the wall at around Carradon. There's a fort at Blackness, most likely, one at Cramond, and then one at Inveresk. And Inveresk seems to mark the eastern end of this coastal defences. Now, the fact there was a Roman presence at Inveresk has long been known. There was an altar discovered in the 16th century, stray finds of coins and pottery. But the fact that the fort lies underneath the modern cemetery to the south of Musselburgh has made it very slow to be disentangled. And you can see it outlined in yellow on this map, an indication of the line of the fort. But it sits on a promontory, it sits on a bluff overlooking the River Esk and would have been garrisoned to a unit of some 500 cavalrymen. The cavalry were a very powerful resource for the Roman army because of the speed and distance they could travel and because there was no local equivalent. They were a very powerful fighting force. The excavations by guard archaeology within the fort have revealed a wealth of finds of cavalry trappings. Cavalry were the, the show-offs of the Roman army. And here we see some of the bronze fittings. They would jangle and gleam as the cavalry were in manoeuvres or in battle. I could spend most of the rest of my time talking about Inveresk. It's a fascinating site, but we shall pick up some samples of that today rather than telling the full story. We'll look at the highlights. The weaponry is represented both by fragments of swords, but also by this magnificent military dagger, a fearsome looking thing, the blade fully a foot long. And again, it's a reminder of the violence lying behind this Roman conquest. Who were the soldiers? Well, we have evidence from the excavations that CFA archeology span did to the north of the fort from the cemetery that analysis of the bones of these people shows them coming from different areas around the Roman world. The Roman army was multicultural, people from all around the captured provinces. And some of those people, we can be confident, were coming from the Danube Basin, from Romania or Bulgaria. Because a couple of them, on their prized pots, they scratched their names so that their messmates wouldn't nick them. And two of those names are characteristically Thracian or Dacian, to Kebulus, who is using the name of one of the great Dacian leaders, and to Drigisa. So we see these like diaspora communities, people travelling with the army. The army is a trade for ambitious young men, travelling with the army from one end of Europe to the other. And another of these men we meet is Kreskens, a cavalryman, a casual discovery by Larni Kavanagh, um, some 15 years ago now, on the edge of a field at Carberry. The bottom half of a rather worn tombstone dragged aside by the plough. Preserved top right here is a depiction of a so-called barbarian, a local. And that allows us to reconstruct the tombstone as something like this glorious example from Cologne. So because the cavalry soldiers were show-offs, they invested money in these kind of big grand monuments. And we have to imagine on the road south from Inveresk, perhaps on the crest at Carberry, a dominant two or three metre high monument telling the story of this cavalry trooper. And the Latin tells us who he was and something of his life. I won't um, disentangle all the Latin for you today. We'll jump to the inscription, to the shades of Crescens, cavalryman of the Alla Subosiana from the detachment of the governor's bodyguard, served 15 years. His heirs set this up. And it gives us a glimpse into this man's life. We can't tell where he comes from. The name Crescens is too general, but the Alice of Bosiana was raised in Gaul, was raised in France and serving in, in Northern England for most of the Roman occupation. We don't know how old he was, but he was 15 when he died. So he's probably in his thirties. What we do know is his, he was in a prestigious commission. He was with serving with the governor, a bodyguard for the governor or another high ranking Roman official, suggesting they were up on the frontier. And this tells us something about the importance of Inveresk, 
We will come back to in a few minutes. The army is only one part of the story of Inveresk. It is one of the few sites in Scotland where we know about the wider community. Soldiers don't travel alone. Soldiers have needs. They need food, they need families, they need um, places to eat, places, supplies to come through to them. And the excavations around the site and the crop marks around the site have shown us outside the fort here is a big civil settlement, fields, graveyards, and all manner of other things. And this reconstruction by Alan Brady, although now wrong in elements of detail, gives you a sense of this community. So there may be 500 soldiers in the garrison, there's another 500 people in the, in the, in the settlement outside. And then here would be the families, the common law wives and children, the traders, the craft workers, the merchants and so on. And some of the activities of these people, glimpses of frontier life in Inveresk, we can see from the finds. So a key challenge, of course, is supply. Where does your food come from? And the pottery, that indestructible medium that archaeologists love so much, gives us clues about this. Bottom right, a pot from Gaul. Top right, from Colchester. Top centre is probably locally made. And to the left, coming from the Thames estuary in southern England. The networks of supply that keep these soldiers fed and watered. The excavations at Inveresk Gate, in advance of development there, uncovered a well at the bottom of which was a barrel. A barrel that once held fine German wine, if that isn't an oxymoron, um, fully two metres tall. The material of the wood, the, the fact they're using um, um, silver fur, indicating it comes from the Black Forest area. So an indication of the scale of supply to the Roman, to the army here. But they're also doing things locally. So around the Fort at Inveresk, there are potters and other craft workers. This material here is being turned out from local clay. Musselburgh's potting tradition goes back 2,000 years. Turning out routine vessels for the soldiers and their families, and also some more decorative pieces. An attempt at a lion here by somebody who's clearly never been face to face with one. It's more Walt Disney than classical art, but it shows the kind of things they're creating in the fort. And it's these glimpses of frontier life, which for me are one of the most exciting things of looking at the material at Inveresk. This leather slipper, which you'd have been worn to keep your feet warm, a high status piece of kit from outside the fort. Gaming pieces to while away boring hours on sentry duty. A whistle made from a goose bone, bringing a bit of sound to this frontier life as well. So for me, one of the power of this material is the life it brings to the community on the frontier. The life and beliefs. Because perhaps the most striking discovery in recent years at Inveresk was when the cricket pavilion was uh, burnt down, presumably by some um, team that had lost badly, and in the excavations underneath the footprint by AOC archaeology, a totally unexpected discovery was made. Remains of a Roman temple containing two altars. Altars to the god Mithras. The inscription is to the invincible god Mithras, and on one side of the altar is a depiction of a griffin, I show him expanded here, the sacred animal of Apollo. On the other side is a lyre, but the lyre too is not connected to Mithras, it's connected to Apollo. And it seems here Mithras as a god of light and a god of salvation in the Roman world is being linked to Apollo, who's also a god of light. Two gods for the price of one, if you like. Mithras is a fascinating god emerging out of the Near East, becomes very popular with soldiers because he offers the prospect of salvation. His cult starts with the, with the conquest of good over evil, of light conquering darkness. There are many echoes with the later tradition in Christianity. And that's seen also in the second altar from the same temple to the sun god. Mithras and the sun god are often equated. 
And this remarkable depiction shows the face of the sun god with rays around his head, which in the darkness of the temple would be illuminated from behind by a lamp. And along the top, the four seasons symbolizing the passing of time. And here, um, characterized as female, spring with summer in her, with leaves in her hair, summer with an off the shoulder dress because it's getting warm, autumn with grapes in her hair, and winter all huddled up against the cold wind of the North Sea. So the finds from Inverness give us this glimpse of frontier life at a terribly important site, here a reconstruction of a, of a temple of Mithras. A site that was booming and bustling, but also, I think, the major urban site on the Roman frontier. There is nothing of this scale elsewhere along the Antonine Wall, and it may well have been the command and control centre for the wall. This is why you have the governor's bodyguard here and other important people. Now, it may be the focal site, but it's not the only one. There are tantalising hints elsewhere in East Lothian of interesting bits of Romans. A stray find from the 19th century from near the church at Trenent is this piece of an oculist stamp, an optician stamp, which they would stamp into salves, Lucius Valerius Latinus, and he's advertising his, his salve for scars and granulation of the eyes, his saffron salve for bad eyes. This is effectively spec savers in the second century, although I'm not sure I would entirely trust the lotions they were using, but it's found among remains of bricks and tiles that suggest some kind of Roman installation there as well. So there is more to find. But the roots of this Roman occupation are shallow. The Romans pull out of Scotland in the 160s and Inveresk is abandoned. There is no remaining town tradition there. And it feels almost like two different worlds, a Roman world that comes in with its hangers on and lives at the fort, lives off the fort and leaves when the soldiers go. And the people in the surrounding landscape who we'll come to in a minute. The Romans come back in again in the early 3rd century, but East Lothian is not their target. They're heading for the, the bad boys of Perthshire and Angus. That's the focus of their campaigning there. So what was the relationship with the Roman world if you lived here, if you were a local? And the cartoon is a slightly cynical view of this with the road Heading, heading straight towards the roundhouse. And the caption is the smirking centurion saying, I expect you've heard about the Roman roads. There was a disruption. There was undoubtedly bloodshed and violence. As I said at the start, this was no peacekeeping force coming into the country. They were intending to conquer and to extract resources from it, whether that was land, whether that was people, whether that was crops and taxation. But East Lothian is interesting because there is no Roman site apart from Inveresk on the very margins of the county. And the same is true of Fife, another agricultural breadbasket, another area with no evidence of Roman occupation. And it seems that these two areas stayed friendly to the Roman world. When the army came in, every person living in what is today Scotland had to make a life or death decision. What do you do? Do you fight? Do you run? Do you deal? And people made all these different choices. It seems in East Lothian, people realised there were values as well as threats to the Roman world. And for the Roman world, of course, you can't fight everybody. And these agriculturally wealthy areas were exactly the, the, the areas where a scorched earth policy would not help them. This was the area that could supply this future part of the province. So for the locals, the benefit is not just keeping your head on your shoulders. It's also the material value of the Roman world. Rome is an opportunity as well as a threat. And Roman objects became highly desirable status goods in our new society. It's the old, what did the Romans ever do for us question. And nobody cared about baths and aqueducts and togas and boring stuff like that. What they wanted was flashy brooches. Here to the left from Aber Lady, including fine enameled examples, to the right from Athel Stainford, one of which is silver. 
Roman objects coming into local hands because wearing a Roman brooch became a sign of connections and of status. As it already was in the Iron Age. If you look at Iron Age material culture, Iron Age jewellery is all about show, is all about status. And the other main kind of Roman thing they're interested in is stuff to do with eating and drinking. These are fines to pray in law. Now terribly fragmentary, but originally looking something like this. And you can understand the value of this material within a local society for showing off with. Because feasting and drinking were already ways in the Iron Age that you would build connections, show your wealth, bring people together. We see this in the world of the cauldron and the cup. Bottom left from Lambert and Moore in Berwickshire, top right from Carling Work. There's a, very, there's a similar one from Gullen, but not in a photographable condition, sadly. So the locals are taking bits of the Roman world or Roman material culture that suit them, that are useful for them. And we can see that in this hoard from uh, New Mains near Whitekirk, um, close to an Iron Age settlement. It includes Iron Age status material, a bangle. It includes a torque, an Iron Age style of neck ornament adapted for the Roman world. It includes part of a bridle bit from riding a chariot, the Ferrari of the period. But it also includes a fragment of a Roman bronze vessel. So jewellery and feasting, these two axes that were running through Iron Age society. There are also surprises lurking in some of the Iron Age sites of East Lothian. I was in our stores yesterday and opened up a box I hadn't opened for a while. The label says Gigan Rock Seacliff. And when you open it up, you discover it contains an enormous Roman pot. An amphora, a transport vessel, coming originally from southern Spain and containing olive oil. Now, I think it's unlikely that the denizens of Gigan Rock were um, frying, their, frying their food in olive oil. It's likely it's come there as a, in secondary use, containing something else. But it's a reminder of the surprises lurking in the stores to raise questions about the links across the Iron Age world and the Roman world. Now, one site stands out in this picture. And it's been already mentioned by both Simon and Ian, and this is the great site of Traprain Law. I've spoken to the Society about Traprain Law and the treasure before, so I'll just pick up some highlights for just now. But as Ian said, the sequence of this site is complicated. It's not like any other hill fort in East Lothian. The origins of the defensive system may well go back to the late Bronze Age, about 1000 BC, and certainly at that point, it is a major power center large numbers of fines coming off it, including Im imported items of gold and bronze. But over the course of the Iron Age, when hill forts boom in East Lothian, as Ian showed, Traprain, it seems, is abandoned. It's a place to visit rather than a place to live. The evidence suggests people gathering for ceremonies. And it's in the Roman period it comes to life once again. And my temptation is to see powerful groups within East Lothian are recognising Rome's need to find leaders to deal with and choosing to move on to Traprain Law and to make this the centre of the area. The area that may or may not be the tribe of the Votidini. The people on Traprain become effectively client kings of Rome. They are serving um, they're keeping East Lothian sweet for Rome. And there's a wealth of Roman material coming off the site as a result. More Roman finds from Traprain than the rest of Iron Age Scotland put together. Glassware, pottery, brooches, and remarkable things like this alphabet stone. People are learning Latin on the site. And that shouldn't surprise us. Elsewhere, on the edges of the Roman world, we see the children of leaders being educated in the Roman way, serving in the Roman army, even going to Rome itself. The idea that this was happening on Traprain shouldn't surprise us. So 
So at this period, in the 1st and 2nd centuries, Roman finds are found widely across East Lothian. The blue dots represent sites producing Roman artefacts. The blue star is Traprain Log. Many, many people have access to these things, most likely through the people on Traprain spreading them from the, the beneficiaries they're receiving. But this changes in the 3rd and 4th centuries. Rome has abandoned Scotland by this point. Hadrian's Wall is the edge of the empire, but they are still very concerned to keep the northern frontier quiet. And one way to do that is to keep your friends sweet. And the people in Traprain are acting as the eyes and ears of the Roman world to the south. Now, it does seem that many of the settlements in East Lothian do get abandoned at this time. It may be settlement clusters onto Traprain itself. The hill is fortified again. For those who walk up to the site to admire the view, the path cuts across the rampart, the so-called Cruden Wall, which may well be the, 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 the wall that gives the name of the spear shafts to the site. It may be there's a palisade or something along the top of this. This blue wall is constructed in the late 4th or 5th century, marked here, and within it, dense occupation. Whatever we have excavated, there are remains of this state. So the site is densely settled in the 3rd and 4th centuries, into the 5th century, and they're receiving these remarkable finds from the Roman world. This comes from a palm-sized glass cup with glorious engraved decoration. They're also serving the Roman world in other ways. These finds are 4th century military equipment. People who served in the Roman army are dropping that material on Traprain Law. And it's likely that some of the people from the site are serving the Roman world. Which is one context, one likely context, for the remarkable find that's been mentioned several times already. The find that stimulated our society's foundation, the Great Hoard of Hacksilver from Traprain. I have already spoken to you last year, I think it was, at extend, extended length on this. So I'm sure you'd all know about the wonderful nature of it. 23 kilograms of silver. The biggest and best such find from anywhere in or beyond the Roman world. Now originally, this was high status material sitting on the dining tables of the Roman elites. And some of the reconstructed vessels give you a sense of that. The platters and the bowls, or things like this dish here with a nereid, a sea nymph riding a sea panther. They would have been used for washing the hands table or for washing the body as part of bathing, um, high status female bathing practice. But the condition of it when it came to, into the ground was in pieces hacked, broken and chopped. And when Alexander Curl excavated it in 1919, you can almost hear the disgust in his voice, these barbarians chopping this loot to pieces. It's always seemed a slightly odd interpretation because Spain was in good terms, it seems, with the Roman world. Were they really also looting and capturing silver from southern Britain or beyond? And we've just completed a big project, the one I've spoken to you about before, looking again at this phenomenon of hack silver, which shows this is not a barbarian phenomenon. The red dots come from both sides of the Roman frontier and showing the dominance of bullion. The reason for chopping these things up was bullion. Vessels being chopped carefully into quarters, the example from Traprain here. Silver being weighed carefully into batches of pound or half pound weights. So this hoard from the Netherlands, the silver weighs exactly half a pound. It's an archaeology of economic crisis as the Roman world starts to crumble. Powerful people chopping up their silver because it's portable. But it's also an archaeology of politics dealing with the world beyond the Roman frontier, either to hire troops or to pay off bad people. And both of these are possible interpretations for the material coming to Traprain. We've seen the evidence of late Roman soldiers, but it may also be gifts coming north. The story will be complicated, 
because some of these fragments show evidence of long lines chopped and re-chopped again and again. Some of this stuff coming straight from the Roman world, some travelling to the site through highways and byways over more than a hundred years. Its value was raw material, chopped for the melting pot and turned into fine silver fingerings that would catch the eye over a glimmering firelight, or these dramatic silver chains, two of which come from East Lothian, one from where we are today, from near Haddington, one from Traprain Law itself. Conspicuous consumption of this Roman resource. And this Roman silver has a legacy that runs far beyond the short periods of Roman occupation. This silver becomes the power tool for the early medieval period. For the growing leaders on places like Traprain and Edinburgh Castle, silver, Roman silver, was what you used to show off with long after the Roman world had gone. So I hope I've given you some sense today of both the Roman and the local side of the story of the fascination of Roman frontier life, which we see vividly at Inveresk like almost nowhere else in Scotland. The soldiers, the families, the connections, the beliefs, such as the, the Mithraic items, but also the relationship to the local world and how they are reacting to this invading force and the long-term legacy of Rome, the use of Roman material in the centuries beyond. Thank you very much.